So if you listen to the show regularly, you know that uh, every now and then Bishop Frank Caggiano likes to tell us stories about saints to inspire us and to teach us and to encourage us. So today he has the story of six saints, all young people who uh, were tremendous witnesses for the faith. Carlo Acutis, Chiara Badano, Jose Sanchez Del Rio, Pier Giorgio Fersati, Gemma Galgani, and Francesco Prosenti. That's coming up on Let Me Be Frank. So keep your radio right here on 1350 AM, 103.9 FM, or keep us on your phone with the Veritas mobile app. You can get the app at the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or at veritascatholic.com. Let Me Be Frank is brought to you by a grant from Foundations in Faith. Foundations of Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad, the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Okay, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I'm Steve Lee, and it is my great pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, it's good to be with you, especially in the topic we're going to talk about today, which are saints, but almost all of them are young saints. Oh, awesome. Either teenagers or young adults. To disprove the notion that you have to be old to be holy is the answer (laughs) is you could be holy at any age. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah, but it, it seems like in the last 150 years, we have been blessed with some really extraordinary young people who have had lives of heroism, right, and sanctity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can't wait to find out who we're talking about mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, that's it's great because, you know, it's true. And especially for young people, uh, w- when they hear about, I don't know, somebody from 300 A.D., who was old and a bishop. That's great, but it's not really inspiring. They can't really relate. Um, I mean, I barely remember it. (laughs) 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 Right. (laughs) But exactly. Uh, No, exactly. Exactly. But some of these are are, uh, internet fans. Some of them were famous for surfing and uh, mountain climbing. Uh, others were, you know, the talk of the town. One was a a, a real, I, I was going to say womanizer, that's not fair, but a person who was the life of the party and had many, many different girlfriends. I mean, it's quite the cast of, of individuals. Cool. I get, So you gave a hint about some of them. Yeah, so, uh, exactly. So I'm excited, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sure you know almost all of these. So I'm going to test you. All the okay, let's see. <laughs> and just for people listening, we don't prepare ahead of time. So this is right. cold for my friend, I have, Mr. Lee. I have, I have no idea who we're talking about. And actually, I've had uh, listeners tell me that they love when you put me on the spot. They think it's hilarious. Yeah, well, here, <laughs> so, they're, they're going to be laughing up a storm today. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, let's dive in, Excellency. Okay. Uh, where do you want to start? Okay, so... Just a few preliminary comments. The first is, in all seriousness, sanctity and perfection are not the same thing. And that should be edifying for all of us of all ages. Yes. Because to become a saint means that your, your, your pursuit of holiness overtakes your life. And Christ becomes the center of your life. And you remain faithful to him. But you are not perfect. Only Our Lady and Our Lord. Yes. Right? So that's one. The second is, when I research these saints, it's amazing how many of them died with tremendous suffering. And diseases that we now take for granted, like tuberculosis. Hmm. But if I'm not mistaken, at least three of them, of the eight that if this time will go through, um, died from tuberculosis. And you say to yourself, my goodness, I mean supposedly, but even in our own age, sadly, is that there were people who died from TB all right, yeah. and polio, but particularly TB. So that's another interesting observation. And yeah. the other is that um, 
all of them had some significant formational figures in their lives, whether it was a teacher or a babysitter or an aunt or a maternal grandmother. In other words, all of these young people were accompanied by someone in faith. And many times it was not their father and mother, their natural father and mother. So mm -hmm. when we talk about the one and we talk about encountering Christ and also a community of faith accompanying you, uh, I think the lesson to be learned is do not be afraid to accompany someone else because you might actually be the catalyst for their sanctity. Right? Yes. Okay. So the first one you clearly know, Carlo Acutis. Yes. Okay. So he was born in 1991, died in 2006 at the age of 15 years old. Now, my friend, what do you, and of course you know, you know about Carlo, what would you, yes. what would you share? What, what do you know about him? Yeah. So he's, uh, he's our first millennial saint. Uh, meaning he was a, a person uh, born after 19, what, 90? Yeah. Whatever that generation Got is. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so, you know, today's uh, young adults should be able to relate because he was uh, their um, cohort mm -hmm. and he uh, he loved, he had a deep love for, well, the town of Assisi. Mm -hmm. So that's where his body is now. Um, and a, and a real strong, incredible devotion to the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. So he built a website that documented all the Eucharistic mir mir miracles, mm -hmm. uh, from over the years. Um, and, uh, I, he, he died from a sickness, but I don't remember what it was. He died from leukemia. Mm, okay. At 15. Well, I think you hit on, on the major points. First and foremost, when you read the life of Carlo, you're reading the life of what ordinarily would just seem like an ordinary teenager, right? Fun loving, um, social, bright, yes. uh, loved, loved the internet. I fascinated with it. W was a website designer. Yeah. So he was a pioneer even in that, right? Because that was that's almost what now 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, he was born into an Italian family, but in England. And they returned to Italy. And when when Carlo was four years old, his maternal grandfather died. And Carlo spoke of his grandfather coming to him in a dream to be asked to pray for him. And that began wow. uh, uh, the, the fascination that he had with the spiritual life at the age of four. The other wow. thing that was interesting is he had, because his family was wealthy, so he didn't come from a poor family. He had a Polish babysitter. And the Polish babysitter actually was a very devout Catholic and was a formative presence. on. And he, didn't, he doesn't go into much detail but the babysitter spent the majority of the time with him, right? Like nannies or au pairs in the modern world and all the rest. So, so that's something. So you have an Italian born in England with a Polish babysitter who's the influence in faith. So only in the Catholic Church. Yes, that's like that. Yeah. Um, he, as you say, as a little boy, had a fascination a deep desire after he received First Holy Communion at the age of seven, either before or after Mass, which he religiously went to, to spend time before the tabernacle, right? And the interesting thing is, as he grew older, that translated into a, a, a disposition, right, to stand with the poor. So he had disabled young people of his same age, which he took a special, they had a special place in his heart. And when they were in school with him and they were bullied, he would stand and defend them. Wow. So there was an intuition, right? He volunteered to work with the homeless and the destitute. But one of the things he loved to do, imagine this, is to play, is to play on his PlayStation video games. So yes. much so that his peers called him a geek. Imagine Huh. So to your point about the website of Eucharistic Miracles, he created a website that documented the Eucharistic miracles throughout history and throughout the world. 
And it, now it has given birth to an entire ministry in the church. We just recently had an exposition, right, at St. Francis of Assisi, right, yes. in, right in Weston, where, mm-hmm. and it's amazing, there are hundreds of documented Eucharistic miracles throughout yes. history. Mm-hmm. So what was the entree for Carlo Acutis to take his natural gifts, his natural propensities, and his deep fascination and acuity with the, with the internet, with the, with the web world, what allowed that to become the, the launching pad for his, his really his sanctity? I think there are at least two. If we give as his, the influences of his family, but most especially his Polish babysitter and others whom we, he met along the way, that's a given. There are two. The Eucharist is clear, number one. And number two, it was his suffering. Hmm. It was his suffering. He, when he developed leukemia, he told his parents that he would offer his sufferings for both Pope Benedict XVI and the Catholic Church. Wow. And he often said, and I wrote this down so I got this right, he said, I offer to the Lord the sufferings that I will have to undergo for the Pope and for the Church. And he had asked his parents to take him to some of the places where the Eucharistic miracles occurred, and he fell too ill. So, in fact, he died before he could do it, and that is why he's buried in Assisi, as you said. And, I mean, with simplicity and the joy of his heart, I could think of no better place where he would be buried. Yeah. Yeah. So, so why is this fascinating? In my mind, for this reason, it's fascinating because he, how many of our young people are fascinated with the digital continent? Mm -hmm. And there are many, many pitfalls. But what about if we introduced our young people to what Acutis created and to kind of pique their curiosity, say this technology can also be a place which we could bring the love of Christ and the message of Christ into the world, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And he died at the age of... 15 in 2006, 16 years earlier, there is a second young woman. Have you ever heard of Chiara Badano? I, I actually have because my family has a devotion to her. Oh, then let's hear. Yeah. Okay. What do, what do you know? Let so me start she, it off if I may. Yes, She please. died in 1990. She was born in 1971. You know, it's very sobering. She was born, I was 22 years old. Could you imagine? And she died when she was 19 years old. Okay, yeah. what do you know? Yeah, so she was in my cohort. We were both Generation X. And well, uh, you know all these generations. Good for you. <laughs> I say very young, young, less young, you know, middle age. That's how I characterize it. So keep going. All right. <laughs> um, so she was, she's from, uh, she was in Italy. She mm-hmm. lived in Italy. Mm-hmm. She was uh, pretty and athletic and popular. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then one day she um, discovered a pain in her elbow. I guess she was playing tennis and discovered that she had, I think it was sarcoma in her bones. Yeah. Well, a bone cancer, right? Bone cancer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and just um, through her own physical suffering was just a radiant light of Jesus. Um, She, comforted other patients in the hospital, even though she was suffering so much. Um, she found a lot of pain uh, when she walked, and yet she took the time every day to walk with a girl who was not Christian. I think she was not Christian, but she was very depressed. And so Chiara Badano spent time walking with her every day. Mm-hmm. And and then the only other thing I know is that the um, I think it was the bishop came to visit her in the hospital because he heard about her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when he was bedside, just looking at her, he said, Kiara, that light in your eyes, where does it come from? 
and right. she attributed to Jesus. Yes. No, that's, so, that's beautiful, my friend. You took all my notes. Excellent. I'm sorry. We just no well, our family. Plus. <laughs> our family just loves her because because uh, my wife suffered from bone cancer, and thanks be to God, she's um, recovered and recovering now. But uh, we just we prayed to Kiara Badano a lot. Yeah. So you know what's interesting about Kiara is. Her name means clear, right, in Italian. So when when her nickname was given Luce, it literally means the clear light. Oh, wow. Right? And therefore, that sparkle in her eyes that you're referring to, right? It's interesting. What was the formative influence in Chiara's life? It was the Focolare movement, which she was introduced when she was nine years old. Right. And the founder of the Focolare movement, her name also, Chiara Lubitsch, mm. she was her spiritual mentor. And what's interesting is from nine years old on, and she died at 19 years old, the image of Christ suffering or Christ forsaken or Christ left alone in his suffering animated her religious imagination and I think Improvidence was preparing her for the odyssey that she would have in her bone cancer, which lasted two years. And bone cancer is extraordinarily, as you know, Steve, is extraordinarily painful. Yeah. Right? So she had a good relationship with her parents, although it's very well documented. She did not always obey them and she would and periodically fight with them. Again, this hope for the us for the rest of us. Right? Yes. But in the, in the Focolare movement, which is open to even people outside of the Catholic faith, right? So it, there's a focus of, of unity, right? There's a focus of the, when one is distressed, right? In the name of Jesus, you reach out to them, right? And you, you bring them, you accompany them. Even before she developed leukemia, she was teased at school. Mercifully, merciless, no, wait. Merciless, hmm? merciless. Lee. That's the word. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to edit any of that out. I no, no, that. no. It's too many syllables. <laughs> because she, she had strong beliefs. And in, in her teenage years, she didn't, she didn't apologize for what she believed in, even yeah. though she failed in her first year of high school. <laughs> I mean, right? Yeah. More hope right. for, for us mere mortals, right? I mean, yes. But. But it's, it's this image, when you think of her, is of Jesus forsaken, Jesus suffering. Right? And she refused morphine as a teenager because she wanted to experience, to be one with Christ in his suffering when he refused the vinegar mixed with gall. He did not want to, to have that moment adult. She did not too. Now I have to tell you, to offer your sufferings to Christ in that way is extraordinary for anybody of any age, but most importantly, right, for a young person. Yes. Right? Yeah. And she underwent chemotherapy, and it didn't work. All her hair fell out, and she would simply say, for you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do this for you. But there's one other thing I want to share about this. You may know this incident in her life when she had the visitation by the lady. Yeah. When she was undergoing a medical procedure, which was particularly painful, Chiara said that she was visited by a lady. And she described the experience by saying, the woman had a beautiful smile. She came into the room and she took her by the hand. And by touching her, she had this sense of courage and peace. And when she disappeared and she could no longer see her, nonetheless, she, was le she, was, she left her with this immense sense of joy and the fear that she was experiencing about what was happening had literally disappeared. And I mean, who was the lady? Really? Yeah. Who was the lady? And then there's one other thing she said, which is extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary, right? So when all the therapies failed 
and she could no longer walk, right? She simply said this, if I had to choose between walking again and going to heaven, I wouldn't hesitate. I would choose heaven at the ripe age of 18. And when she was dying, she asked her mother to help her to plan her wedding Mm -hmm. because her death would be the moment that she would be one with Jesus Christ in the glory of heaven. I mean, it it brings tears to my eyes. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. So another model for all of us of any age. Yes. Okay. Number three, we're doing a great time. (laughs) <laughs> you have also heard of him. I think many people have heard of him. They call him Saint Joselito, Jose Sanchez del Rio, who died in 1928, a few weeks short of 15 years of age. You know his story. Tell us what you know, Steve. So uh, he was a kid during the Cristero War when uh, the Mexican government was cracking down on Catholics and the Catholic church and really brutally persecuting Catholics. He wanted desperately to fight uh, with the Cristero military, but he was too young. So he served the general, I think it was. Yes. Yes. He, um, he ended up rescuing the general uh, at one point during a battle and getting captured himself. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, his uncle, I guess, was in charge uh, for the government of trying to break this kid, 14 years old. Do you, he's 14, Excellency? Yes. He died okay. just a few weeks short of 15. Actually, w- what's interesting about Jose, first of all, to Cristero, to think that Mexico, with its long history of fidelity to the church, had that period of its life where in its own constitution, there was this anti-clerical, anti-ecclesial provisions in the Constitution. And I I meant to look this up, but I I didn't have the time, whether or not those provisions still exist in the Mexican Constitution. I hope not. I I doubt it. But in this time, it did, right? So they executed priests. They confiscated church property. They closed out the monasteries. Almost kind of like the reign of terror in Napoleon's time, right? Same kind of idea. Yeah. All right. So... um, he, this little boy, because you are correct, this general, they would not accept he was too young to fight, right? They made him the flag bearer. Now imagine in the old days you would go out to battle and the flag would be the first one out. So he was the first one. <laughs> first one. Talk about a sitting duck. He would go out <laughs> and he went out. And in this period of intense battle, right, there was – either a soldier or the general, one, there was a man who was in the combat whose horse got killed, not he did not get killed. And Jose gave him his horse to escape, which meant he could not escape, which meant he was then captured. So in effect, he exchanged his life for someone else at 14 years old. Amazing. Uh, really? I mean, amazing doesn't even describe it, right? Yeah. Yeah, And to your point, and again, remember, it's a religious persecution. So this is not a war on class. It's not a war of economics. It's not a war of power and privilege. It's a war against Christ and the church. So this young boy had such an t- intense love for Christ and the church that he was, he towered among these other ones who were there who were trying to break his spirit. I mean, we talk about the giants. These men were nothing compared to this little boy. And how did they try to break his spirit? Number one, they watched him and and forced him to watch the hanging of another individual, a man in the same movement, the Cristero movement. So as a little boy, he watched this man hang. Number two, they cut, which he's famous for, right? They cut the bottom of his feet and had him walk through the town towards the cemetery, right? 
Actually, I re- had read accounts where they actually had him walk over live charcoals, burning charcoals, which would have been enormously painful without your, your feet already being cut open. Could you imagine? Yes. Refused. Absolutely refused. And they said, well, stop. You have to cry death to Christ the King. And he said, I will never. It's viva Cristo Rey. Long live Christ the King. And then third, they took a machete and started to cut him in different parts of his body. It almost gives you the impression of being crucified. Wouldn't do it. And then they finally put him to death. What an extraordinary young man of self-sacrifice for a stranger, fidelity to Christ regardless of the suffering. And let me tell you something else. We remember him. We don't remember the fools that do, did this to him, do we? Yes. They are right. lost in the annals of history that is not worth remembering. But we remember him. A major yes. lesson for people to understand when you talk about greatness. What is real greatness in the life of the church? Well, greatness is sanctity in Jesus Christ. Those, that story will sing forever. The other ones are not worth remembering, and they never will be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's there's a good movie made about this, Excellency. It's oh, really? called For Greater Glory. Yeah, For Greater Glory. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really well done. Um, and it's about the Chris Darrow movement in general, but it, it he's the main – he's one of the protagonists in the movie. And my son uh, at the time, my middle guy, I think he was 15 when he saw it. And after we turned it off, he said – if I watched that movie before I got confirmed, I would have picked him as my confirmation saint. Really? Yeah. So uh, so repeat the name again, because there are people listening who may want over the summer, if they have some leisure time, to watch it. Yes. It's For Greater Glory. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and there's some real uh, big time actors in it too. So it, it's really well done. Yeah. Um, and also in our diocese, there is a tremendous devotion to St. Joselito at St. Joseph's in uh in norwalk ah yeah okay tremendous and i was there for the blessing of the shrine that they had and there must have been 800 people there at least because they were standing i think saint joseph's hold between seven eight hundred there were people standing in the church every seat was taken wow tremendous wow. tremendous do we have time for one more Let's take a quick break, Excellency, okay. and then and do more on the on the other side. So this is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Um, we'll be right back. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Uh, Excellency, so we've done Carlo Acutis, uh, Chiara Badano, and Jose Sanchez Del Rio. Who's next? Pier Giorgio Frassati, who died in 1925. So we're coming up to the centenary of his death in a few years. 
Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. And he died at the age of 24. And what did he die of? Polio. Hmm. Which is fascinating to think that right now we have the ability. So if he had not died, I wonder what life of sanctity he could have had in a fuller sense. But now in the glory of heaven, he has the fullness of everything. Okay. You know about Pier Giorgio, I'm sure. Yeah, I know a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, handsome, um, very charming guy, the son of a very wealthy uh, father and mother. Um, I think he used to get in trouble with his parents because he would give his clothes away to the poor. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, mm -hmm. well known because he was um, – Big time, I think he was a big time mountain climber or something like he that. He was a mountain climber and an and, and accomplished swimmer. Okay. Right? And to your point, his family was well off. In fact, his father owned the newspaper La Stampa, which still exists in Italy. Yes. And it is the liberal end of the political chaos we call Italian politics, right? It's on the <laughs> liberal end, right? And his father was active in national politics. He served as the Ital Italian ambassador to the German state, right? Which was wow. quite the, right? Yes. And, um, and his mother was an artist. So what an eclectic background, right? Yeah. So you hit the nail right on the head. Pier Giorgio's faith was lived through a commitment to social justice, to charity, and to the poor. Right. He lived in Turin and Turin is a modern city. Now, then it was slowly up and coming at the turn of the 20th century. And there were many, many poor and disenfranchised. So he came from wealth. He came from influence and he used all of that. Right. To help those around him. And it wasn't so well received by his parents, particularly his father. Right? So what, what are some of the stories of Pierre Giorgio? So, for example, there was an occasion when, and this was not uncommon, where the poor would ring doorbells or knock on doors to ask for food. And there was a woman who begged for her son. Her son had no shoes. And to your point, he took off his shoes and gave them to the boy, right? And you could imagine their parents' reaction. There was another incident where another man knocked on the door. His father was home and the man asked for aid and the father refused to ask to give him any aid because the man was drunk. And Pier Giorgio was so upset, <coughs> went to his mother. He was so upset that they had turned this man away that she sent her son to go find him, bring him back. And she fed him dinner. Wow. Right. And he is the one who is called the terror by his friends because of the practical jokes that he oh, lived, that's right. right? Yes. He bitterly opposed Benito Mussolini and fascism. He belonged to the apostolate of prayer and he also belonged to Catholic action, which is the movement of lay people uh, that is committed to realizing the principles of Catholic social teaching. And his famous saying is, charity is not enough. We need social reform. Hmm. And social reform, I mean, charity can be done beautifully. It can be done sacrificially. But social reform is taking on the annals of power and the structures that create the poverty. That puts you in a very dangerous realm. Because those structures exist because people are profiting from them. And when you take on that, you are risking your life. At least in this age, you are risking, and he was risking his life. He very much put into practice Pope Leo XIII's Rerum Novarum, which is the first great encyclical of Catholic social teachings, right? And at, before he died, 
he wanted to become a mining engineer so that he would be of service to miners who were so bitterly abused by the operators of mines. And it was not, it was not uncommon, right, that miners died because of poor construction, cutting corners, horrific labor conditions, horrific, mm. just the dust, right? And he wanted to be of help to them. On, on a personal level, all right, so he lived to be 24. He loved museums. He loved theaters. He loved parties. He loved to dance. He spoke German. He spoke French. And wow. he had many a relationship, okay? Just like you described with Chiara, one day he was boating with friends and he realized a very sharp pain in his back. And what he soon discovered, right, after he was followed by a headache and fever, that it was polio. And I don't remember exactly how long it was between diagnosis and death, but it was not very long. Mm -hmm. When he was dying, his final words were, he was, I mean, this breaks my heart. His mother was holding him in her arms. His final words were, may I breathe forth my soul in peace with you and died. Now, you would imagine that a man of his pedigree, of his family and their wealth, that at the funeral, you would be what we call in Italian, tutti pezzi grossi. All the big shots would come out. And they yes. did. But what was astonishing to everyone at that age was in the path that the body took from the home to the church was lined with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of poor people, destitute people, homeless people, who paid their respects to him for the reputation he had already developed of being a man who stood with those who had no one to stand with them at 24 years old. Yeah. And even after his death, even after his death, people were maligning him because there were false allegations made about his relationship with women hmm. when his cause had already opened. And Pius XII suspended the cause. And they investigated and they proved all of those allegations to be 101% false. Right? So it makes you wonder when you see such sanctity, why do, why do some hearts react in such a bitter way, such a closed way? It's almost as if the holiness before them is, is, is something that is repulsive. Why? Perhaps I'm being judgmental here, so please forgive me. But because it's a holy reproach, because something inside of you says, well, why am I not like this? Well, if I can't be like this, I don't want this at all. Yes. Yeah. All the more reason he did what he did. Right? Yeah. Yep. Tremendous. So he is, right, blessed. So he's not a saint yet. He's blessed. John Paul uh, beatified him. And please, God, sooner or later in my lifetime, before I get too much older, I want to be there at his canonization. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand for the creed. Now, <laughs> the, next, the next one. Have you ever heard of Gemma Galgani? I... I know that you like the Italian saints, Excellency. Uh, well, because they just can't help it. It's just, <laughs> they have such a large amount. <laughs> yes, because Italy is overflowing with saints. Oh, could you then? We were talking at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, Gemma Galgani, she, uh, I, I know the name, but I don't know okay. very much about her at all. I didn't either, to be honest until I did the research. And you know, you point out something very important and I have to raise this for our listeners. It is not accidental 
that a lot of the saints in the earlier age of the 20th century were Italian. And it's not because the Italians have the corner on sanctity, but it is true that the Italians had the corner on the, on the apparatus of the church. Hmm. Meaning that when these individuals came forward with sanctity, because at that time in the church's life, most of the curia was Italian, and most of the prefects and the bishops involved in the curia were Italian. They had the ability to bring forth the causes in an effective way that others did not. Now in the reforms, one of the great reforms in the Vatican Council is the internationalization of the curia and its leadership. So now you see in the, in the, the beatifications and canonizations that there are priests, religious, and lay people from all around the world because finally now we can recognize sanctity everywhere it occurs because during these ages, there were equally holy young people whose memories are rem remembered locally, but did not have their cause. And quite frankly, maybe some of their causes will come forward. So there, there is a lot of truth to what you're saying, but I think it's because of the way the church worked in those times. Right? That makes sense. So Gemma died in 1903. And she was 25 years old. And she was a mystic at a young age. But what I found fascinating with her is that she received the stigmata. And she had a deep passion for the passion of Christ. In fact, she has been called by some as the daughter of the passion. Interestingly, Right, She was the fifth of eight children. Her father was a pharmacist. And soon after her birth, her mother and father moved to a city called Luca. And her mother developed tuberculosis. So Gemma was sent to a private school where she was taught. And once again, it was there that there were formative presence of, of the women who ran it, who were deeply devout, who began to form her in the faith. So again, she's an example of being formed, not necessarily by your immediate family, but those who were kind of like her adopted family. But by the time she was, let's see, nine, eight years old, her older brother died, younger brother died, mother died, and her brother who was studying to be a priest died. Oh my word. So she was surrounded with suffering and death. And when she was 19 years old, her father died. So the rest of her siblings, she had to raise. So she is a, a perfect example of the response in sanctity to the experience of profound suffering in life. For when we experience so much tragedy, like Job, in the Christian context, you either do one of two things. You either rail against God, cry out against God, reject the circumstance and can easily turn away from faith, or you use it as a prism through which you sit before the mystery of Christ's passion and come to understand the deeper, beautiful implication of Christ's death for our love of us and how before such suffering. It's an invitation to enter into the passion of Christ and recognize that the people are suffering, are loved by Christ, will be cared for as we are. So at 21 years, age, at years of age, she began to display the signs of the stigmata. And she would receive special messages. Oftentimes she would be in ecstasy, totally unaware of the people around her. It was even said that she herself reported to, to levitate in that moment of ecstasy. Right? Could you imagine? And she received the stigmata on the eve of the solemnity of the sacred heart of Jesus. And this is how she described it, that in this moment of prayer and ecstasy, she experienced this fire that touched her hands, her feet, and her side. And the fire wasn't... It was painful, 
but then it led to the sense of 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 a, a joyful healing and she sensed our lady was there and when she got up she realized she saw the blood stains that mimic but the stigmata now not everyone believed her the doctor that was called in said that she was hysterical uh, a, a, a one of her sisters claimed that she was lying. One of them said that they thought they saw a, a sewing needle in the house, and this was self-inflicted, right? But the, per, but the but the interesting thing is, right, when the doctor examined her, said to the person, this is a hoax, so let's see the wounds so we could treat them. And they took a towel and in her hands wiped off the blood and there was no wound to examine. Huh. Because it, without the eyes of faith, there's nothing to see. It's quite remarkable. And she too died from tuberculosis. Could you imagine all of these, all of these young people who died in such great holiness? by a disease now that we hopefully, please God, have eradicated. Anyway, yeah. so she's a living witness to the beauty and the passion of Christ. Hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's change gears. Have you ever heard of Francesco Possenti? No. Otherwise known as Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows, a passionist. He lived from 1838 to 1862. So it means he died when he was 24 years old. And he was born into a professional family, but he entered into the Passionist congregation. He had a tremendous devotion to the sorrows of the Virgin Mary. Born himself, guess where? In the CZ. <laughs> in Italy. An Italian? Could you imagine? Wow. <laughs> and get this. He was baptized in the same font that Francis of Assisi was baptized in. Oh, cool. That's cool. Isn't that amazing? Yep. So he also gives me great hope because in his religious upbringing, he also was not perfect. He... While he, he had great charity and piety as a little boy, he was also very vain. When he went out to visit friends, he would take hours dressing to make sure he looked immaculate. He also had a temper and he could explode in anger growing up. And he, like the, the former, was called the, the terror, right? P.F. Giorgio. He was called the dancer because he was an accomplished dancer, right? With lots of the young ladies growing up. <laughs> so he's not the sort of fellow you would say is going to become a saint or in this case, you know, beatified. And... But it's interesting how suffering played in his life because twice he faced serious suffering in his life. And twice he made the promise that he would enter into religious life upon his recovery. And twice, he didn't quite follow through on what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you think the conversion came from? It's fascinating. In the strangest of places. All right. So cholera, which was common at the time, swept through the, the town where he lived. One of his sisters died because of it in Spoleto. So they are all involved with a procession in honor of Our Lady. And they took out an ancient icon of the Virgin Mother of God. And they processed it through the village into the cathedral. And Pocenti was at the procession. And when the image passed by, he heard a voice in his own mind, a woman's voice say, why do you remain 
in the world. And he began to realize at that moment of what our Lord through Our Lady was asking of him. And so he didn't go into the Jesuits. He, didn't go. he decided to go into the Passionists. And he did. And he entered in 1856. Interestingly, on September 19th, which is a special place in my heart because that was Mama's birthday too, September 19th. This, of course, many, many years before. So he took the name as a Passionist of Gabriel, of Our Lady of Sorrows, right? And in the brief time he lived in the Vishen, he grew, right? In tremendous joy and tremendous love of Our Lady and a deep appreciation of the sorrows that Our Lady underwent herself, right? And once again, he died from tuberculosis and in receiving, right, the diagnosis itself, he received it with great joy because we were a moment of his suffering to be united with Christ's suffering. And at the moment of his death in 1862, just as he was dying, imagine this, he was laying in bed and right before he breathed his last breath, he literally jumped up in his bed and was looking straight forward and his face became radiant like we speak about Chiara, radiant, right? As he reached out with his hands to put into his hands, the hands of a person who had entered into the room to take him. And everyone around him, all the passionists who were with him said it was the mother of God who was taking him home. Amazing, no? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing I found, which is interesting, the Shrine of St. Gabriel has 2 million visitors each year. This man. It's the 15th most visited Catholic shrine in all the world. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had no idea. Uh, yeah. For a man who's not well as known. well known. In Italy, is it he's extremely well known. It, is it in Spoleto? The, yes. The, the shrine? Okay. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yep. And they gather high school students every year in March to go there. Thousands and thousands and thousands, right? I think it's 100 days before they're expected to graduate to pray for success in academics and all the rest. But it's among the young in Italy. He's very well known. And that's why I raised him here as well. In my, in my research, I thought, yep, this is a name we should know. Amazing. You, you know what strikes me, Excellency, about uh, these guys – Francesco, Pier Giorgio Frassati, mm -hmm. Carlo, Chiara, is that uh, when you think of when you think of uh, holiness and and saintly people, you know these these people that you're talking about today, they're not your folded hands, eyes down, you know, right. walk around with a pious air um, people. They're like normal young people right. um, who love fun and and everything else, but there's this, this docility and this obedience to following the call of Jesus, however it comes to them. Without a doubt. See, and that's the key. See, remember the father of evil, deception. And therefore, he, he deceives us to think that if you're not perfect, if you're not this cardboard stereotyped sort of holier than thou, then you're never going to be a saint, in which case, why try? And all of these young people prove that we strive for perfection, but we won't achieve it. There are faults and limitations that we give to the mercy of God. But in the end, if we surrender our heart to him, in all our different circumstances, most especially in challenge and suffering, and we allow him to lead us, then we are in the road of holiness. And if we surrender to his will, that's the key ingredient to it all, that he's mm -hmm. in charge, we are not. And he will take us with our faults because perfection lies on the other side of the mystery of death for us. Right? And don't believe anything else. And don't despair of your ability to be a saint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We all call to be. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. I, I know you have a couple more on the list, but is it okay if we yes. holster those yes. for another day? Yes, but I'm okay. just going to give his name. Okay. The next one on the list would have been, listen to this one. Yeah. Nuncio Suprizio. <laughs> 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 I'm going to look him up before we talk again. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's take one more break. We'll come back with a listener question. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Be right back. Okay. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. So, Excellency, I, I have a couple questions here that came in from listeners, but if you don't mind, I want to exercise my own- uh, Oh, prerogative. Uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> because- I'm here at the mic, and so, but because I do have a question for you, Excellency, mm-hmm. and it's not related to anything that we've talked about so far. Um, I've personally been struggling a little bit with distractions during prayer, mm-hmm. whether it's when I'm saying the rosary mm-hmm. and my mind starts to wander, or I sit, I when I sit in adoration, um, and I try to silence my mind mm-hmm. and. I, I, I'm just I'm just all over the mm-hmm. place. So I wanted to ask you if um, you have thoughts, advice, something to help me stay more focused when I'm praying. Yeah, it's that's a great question, and I think for those who are heavenly burdened, it's very easy to become distracted and pray because the burdens you carry are burdens out of love and charity and out of duty and responsibility. And I would love to give you the, the, the pious answer to say, leave them all behind and sit in, in prayer. But it's very hard to empty your mind. And it's because of love. All right. So two bits of advice. Number one, um, the more you worry about the distraction, the more they will be distracting. Hmm. So it, it, it's something that you want to work on, but it's almost in an indirect way. So in, as soon as you catch yourself distracted, don't worry about what you lost in the distraction, but just focus your attention again on what you're doing because that gives the distraction greater legs. Hmm. The second is ask yourself in the prayer, who was walking with you in your distraction? So for example, if you're on a path and you're going forward and suddenly you veer off the path, That's what you're doing in distraction and prayer. But who is walking with you? Because the truth is, if you were totally alone, you would never get back. But someone tapped you on the shoulders and said, this is the way back. Hmm. And at least for me, that gives me consolation to know that I, our Lord, our Lady, my mother, St. Anthony, somebody was with me to lead me back. Hmm. Two bits of advice for that. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So I promise we'll get to the, uh, to the other listener questions, uh, on future shows. Um, but if you do have a question for Bishop Frank, send it in on social media, or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So is Veritas Catholic Network. And as always, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Foundation of Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations of Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. What a fun day. Yeah, it was fun. I love these stories. (laughs) Okay, so uh, before we go, Excellency, would you please give us your blessing? In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit come upon each of us as we continue our earthly journey that one day we may too be counted among the saints who will look upon your face and enjoy the glory of everlasting life. We ask that your spirit bless us and guide us in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my friends. See you next week.